All right, my friends. Hey, it's Peter Bowden. Welcome to another live session. Um, this time, my guest is Laura Beth Brown. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Peter. Well, I've known you for a number of years. We connected on Star Island. I don't remember what year that was, but um, through that uh, Lifespan Religious Education Conference. Um, and I've been a fan of your work. Every time I talk to someone, I'm like, I'm a fan of your work. That's because <laughs> the people whose work I love and I learn about, I try and get to know better and talk with. So, Thank you for asking to, me. Yes. Yeah. I'm a fan um, of your work. <laughs> and this conversation is going to be fantastic for, I think, all congregational leaders. Um, you know, we're, we're talking broadcasting to live to our Unitarian Universalist community through my UU Planet mm -hmm. channels. Uh, but I want to tell everyone, this conversation is going to be grounded in Laura Beth's work with family ministry, but it's bringing in a lot of um, work related to multiculturalism, changing culture, change, and a lot of things that I think will apply across areas of congregational life. So I want to challenge everyone tuning in or, or who's just kind of briefly checking this out. Let, join this conversation, listen to this conversation, and then share it because it's going, I know we had a conversation yesterday just getting ready for this interview. I know it's going to be valuable to all of our congregations. So I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Laura Beth Brown. And to people tuning in, in the comments, wherever you're viewing this, just say hi, tell us where uh, you're tuning in from. So Laura Beth Brown is a 500-hour registered yoga teacher uh, with Yoga Alliance an amateur grill chef and the director of family ministry at Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Summit, New Jersey. Yeah. So as um, let's talk yoga. So mm -hmm. primarily vinyasa and prenatal yoga instructor with a therapeutic yoga lens. Mm -hmm. And you've got um, so certifications in prenatal yoga, children's yoga, wait, that's right. off the mat, into the world, which kind of bridges, you said, between yoga, self-inquiry and community action. Mm -hmm. As a singer, song leader, and harmonium player, I don't even know what a harmonium is. What's a harmonium? <laughs> What's a harmonium? It's, a, it's, a, it's like a seated accordion instrument. Okay. So keyboard and a bellows. Oh, my grandfather played accordion. All right. So <laughs> you lead that um, in a form known as kirtan. Is that pronounced right? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so that's a form of bhakti yogi or yoga for devotion. Now, mm -hmm. workshops. I heard about this work you're doing now um, through just word of mouth from people who attended uh a workshop you presented for the Liberal Religious Educators Association. So I want to tell people about the workshop work you're doing. So first, related to yoga, you, uh, Laura Beth leads workshops in bhakti yoga, prenatal yoga, and conscious activism. Mm -hmm. As a religious educator, uh, Laura Beth has led 12-hour workshops on embracing family ministry for uh, with your ministerial supervisor, um, her ministerial supervisor, Reverend Emily Boggess, mm -hmm. I got that right? Emily Boggess. Yep, yep, exactly. So at the Center Institute for Ministers, um, you led workshops on Star Island for Religious Educators. And then last month at the L Liberal Religious Educators Conference, Fall mm -hmm. Conference. And this is something else I'm interested in, but we might have to have another conversation okay. another time. Uh, Laura Beth also leads workshops on volunteer strategy called Stop Recruiting, Start Retaining as a means of collective sustainability for congregations. And I know volunteerism is a huge issue and challenge for our congregations. So maybe we'll weave some of that in, um, but perhaps I'll, well, and if people share this video and it goes far and wide, we'll convince you to come back. So <laughs> before, well, first I want to say, I know uh, our congregations are facing many challenges as the world changes around them, culture, sure technology, demographics, uh, and congregational change is hard. Uh, so before we dive into like this, this exciting work that you, you've been doing um, related to your workshops and work as director of family ministry, tell us a little bit about your congregation. Um, and I know that you um, have an interesting staff structure, uh, but yeah. just get, tell us a little bit about you know, the congregation. Sure. Sure. I think so. I think it's helpful to know that our congregation we have just under 500 adult members and just under 200 children and youth. That's nursery through high school. Um, yep. So we're a good mid-sized congregation. Um, and the structure we have a collaborative leadership structure. So at the 
I guess at the very top of the structure is um, a triangle, and that includes the executive director, who is Tuli Patel, our minister for worship and outreach, who is the Reverend Robin Tanner, and then our minister for congregational life, who is Emily Bogus. And so the three of them have shared power, equal power, and they all report to the board. And then each well, of these- Multiple ministers, I mean, multiple staff with equal power. Yes, All yes, right. including the executive director who is non ordained. So, um, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it, it is. I'm all um, about the collaboration. <laughs> and, uh, and each of these, um, women have, uh, uh, people that they supervise as well. And so I'm going to focus on Emily because she's yeah. my supervisor. Okay. She oversees congregational life, which is faith development, um, and pastoral care. And so uh, with her, I serve as the director of family ministry, which is actually my portfolio is really nursery through fifth grade. And then we also have Jemaine Kripe, who is a credentialed religious educator, and she um, oversees our youth program, which is junior high and high school, six through 12. And then we also have a congregational life assistant, Brian David, uh, who does the administration for us as well as for other areas of the congregation as well. Great. So... So we are very blessed is what I will say. Very yeah. grateful to have such a, a, a large collaborative staff. Yes. And, and I think that the, the collaborative aspect uh, ties into your, the ability for you to do the work that you're doing successfully. Um, yeah. So tell us about the work that you've been doing uh, with family ministry and tied into um, you know, just some of these cultural changes. And you mentioned to me that uh, you've drawn a lot of inspiration from the work of, uh, I mean, the book, Saul, so Soul and Spirit, Leadership for Multicultural Age. So tell us a little bit, like, where where was your congregation and like what was the catalyst for kind of getting inspired to do some things differently, you know, and just tell the story of, you know, really starting this work. Sure. Well, we were, you know, seeing that uh, traditional ways of doing things weren't working. Um, and it was time to take some risks and try new things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we do have a fairly diverse staff, um, and uh, Tuli Patel, actually our executive director, introduced Emily and I to this book, Salsa, Soul, and Spirit by Juana Bordas. And it has been uh, really a basis uh, for how we have structured family ministry, or certainly how we think of family ministry. Um, and so I, Specifically, the book has a number of principles in it, but mm-hmm. the first three that she talks about are what she calls a new social covenant. And so the first of those would be Sankofa, uh, which is, um, you may have seen the bird. It's a, it's a mythical bird who looks backward, mm-hmm. but its feet are facing forward. Uh, and the literal trans- translation of the word is, Um, It is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. And this comes from, I should should note, the Akan uh, tribe in Ghana. Um, But it's really about acknowledging... You said it is not taboo to fetch... What is at risk of being being left behind. So it's about acknowledging where we stand, um, acknowledging where we come from, and the... respecting the insight and the knowledge acquired from the past as a way of understanding the present and creating a strong future. You said there there are three main principles. Do you want to just, why don't we run through each of those um, briefly and then we can dive in. So first was Sankofa. Sankofa, yep. And then the next one is moving from individualism to collective identity. So moving from I to we, which is about you know, a strong sense of belonging and sticking together, that the community takes precedence over the individual whose mm-hmm. identity flows from the collective. Um, we collectivist cultures have highly defined rules or covenants, you know, yeah. and change slowly than individualist cultures. Uh, that collaboration, you know, uh, right. takes um and that cultures, we cultures, uh, collectivist communities value group welfare. They value unity. They value harmony. And because these cultures are tightly woven, there is a wholeness in which differences can exist. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, so that's the second one. Yep. And then the third yep. one um, she defines as mikase sukasa, which is really about a spirit of generosity, and it encapsulates um, a joy and sharing and implying uh, what I have is also yours. Uh, so 
there is a idea of the cyclical reciprocity mm -hmm. that we're continually giving to one another. And she also says that uh, that spirit of generosity is the glue that really holds we cultures together. And something that I think is particularly pertinent just in our world right now is that um, this idea is also about redistribution and ensures that no one accumulates so much wealth and material things that it sends that it sets one person above the others. Um, and the legacy piece that one generation should not take more than their than their share, a legacy of sustainability. So, so grounded in those principles, how does then uh, do those principles speak to what wasn't working before mm -hmm. and and the shift in specific practices that you've been implementing in your congregation? Sure. So I think the Sankofa piece came up for us in a number of ways. Um, when we were looking back at our past, uh, the past history of Beacon, which was formerly the Unitarian Church and Summit, um, we looked for those stories that could inform what we were doing or where we wanted to go or who we wanted to live into. And one of the interesting stories that came up that we learned was during the Great Depression, <clears throat> the congregation um, had a choice of either um, heating the building, like financially, mm -hmm. they had a choice to heat the building or to hire Sophia Lyon Foz to come in for a workshop. So we're one of the New Jersey suburbs of New York City and she was in New York, so she could come, but we could only afford one or the other. Um, and the congregation chose to bring in Sophia Lyon Foz. So from the beginning, our congregation has has had a strong stance and a strong um, uh, uh, desire for lifting up faith development. And so that's the piece that we're pulling from and trying to to hold um, in our mind as we move forward, that inspiration piece. But the other Sankofa piece um, that was that we were really looking um, to uh, came from Kim Sweeney and mm -hmm. uh, Courageous Face con Consulting, her work. And that was um, some of the history and demographics pieces that she lifted up. So uh, the story of how um, Sunday school, Sunday school be, be, um, in our in, in our last, last 60 years, years that, yeah. that, um, basically the thousands of public schools um, that were created for the millions of post-war babies, you know, they um, created these uh, classrooms with specialized teachers and specific subjects and parents drop their children off at school with the implicit message that, that they should leave their child's education to the professionals. Mm -hmm. and Churches followed the lead of right. public schools, and so what happened was um, families were dropping off their children in age-segregated classrooms with the understanding that they should abdicate their responsibility of religious educator um, to the lead volunteer teachers, right? Um, and this was a shift because before then, um, uh, toward the beginning of the 20th century, you know, uh, families were still very much a part of the religious upbringing. They were, parents were still a primary religious educator. So this right. was, right? And so um, Kim noted that, you know, the long-term and unintended consequences to the strategy brought us a generation of people who had very little connection um, to their faith, yeah. um, congregation outside of Sunday school. Um, and I should say that this was also the time when we separated children from worship, right? Mm -hmm. So, so again, um, young people didn't have much connection outside of Sunday school, and so when when our children and youth graduated or left the program, they left the church. And so, since that time, some sixty years ago, we've been struggling to assimilate our children into the life of the congregation ever since. Um, and so, that was a big piece for us, right? Um, and this is manifested in the fact that, you know, uh, well over 70% of our Unitarian Universalist congregations are converts, right? So, right, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and then the other the other piece of the demographic. So one demographic that we've seen that has been a struggle, and you mentioned it earlier, the volunteer piece, this, this reality that there were 80 million baby boomers and only 50 million Gen Xers who are, um, uh, the largest group of parents right now. Uh, you know, the so before we move on, get into that, can you just say again what Kim Sweeney's, um, where, how do people find her work since we're referring to it? It's Courageous, sure. Faith, Courageous Consult Faith Consulting. 
So they just do a search for Courageous Faith Consulting. And yeah, I just want to affirm that Kim's doing great work promoting oh God, really amazing. important conversations um, within our Unitarian Universalist movement around uh, family ministry, how we work with children. And I just want to give her a shout out. And she's on my list of people to talk to as well. Um, so just thank you, Kim, um, yeah. for helping to drive that. And I'm just a fan of everyone who is, see, fan again. Everyone who is driving conversations related to how is our world changing? What do we have to learn? How do we have to adapt? Because we have to be learning much, much faster than we have been because the rate of change in the world is rapidly outpacing how quickly our congregations are typically have changed, which means we're slipping further and further behind. That's part of the reason why I'm bringing more of my work online. So keep learning together, learn faster, learn smarter. Yeah, Kim has been an amazing resource for us. Yep. There's no question. Um, so the demographic piece is, is uh, you know, the baby boomers. So there were 80 million baby boomers, 50 million Gen Xers. And so all of these um, roles uh, uh, that were um, filled in our society mm-hmm. uh, by the baby boomers in our family and our workplaces, our congregations can simply not be filled with 30 million fewer Gen Xers, right? And so we've definitely been experiencing that in our congregations, especially when it comes to volunteers. So we've had to restructure um, for that as well. Um, And then the final sort of ethnic demography piece that she lifted up was that today, roughly 50% of all immigrants in the US come from Latin America and nearly half of all population growth is due to Latin American immigration. And it's predicted that by 2045, um, that those of Latin American descent will replace whites as the majority ethnic group in the US. Um, And so with that, we took that and thought about to consider the current makeup of our congregation and begin in light of this likely reality in just about 25 short years. Mm -hmm. And so that was another big um, sort of uh, piece that we needed to be aware of, the Sankofa piece that we needed to be looking at, that history piece, um, uh, and, and, and what was coming down the line, looking toward the future. So for, for people who are following this conversation, so as you got into this work and lo- started looking at these different principles, uh, how, what did the, what did you do in your congregation? Like what's changed? Yeah. Um, whether it's, I know we've talked about um, the importance of culture versus strategy um, and the importance to address culture if we are going to implement new strategies. So can you share a little bit about like specific things that have changed or maybe some of the process that you've gone through that's been leading to um, some positive outcomes in your community? Sure. So I think I think that moves into the next piece of the um, the eye to the we culture, because that's where that's really where um, uh, family ministry um, starts to come about when mm-hmm. we can move from that I culture to the we culture. And um, so family ministry for us was um, uh, the ways in which it has manifested is moving more towards whole congregational worship, um, including more of that. Um, social action and social justice for all ages, uh, at home or at at home resources. Uh, We're still working toward parent support and education, Um, whole congregational social and educational events. Um, And uh, and so that's the way that it's really manifested. And I, I think for us at the key at the or the key piece to all of this is that we had to lift up two things, which is one that relationships are everything, that none of what we were attempting would be possible if we weren't really focused on building relationships yep. um, uh, with our congregation, um, having our congregation uh, build uh, relationships of, you know, across ages. So that was really important. So, but Go ahead. You, know, you mentioned the importance of relationships. Uh, how, I mean, one of the things that I keep encountering in my work, especially as I'm looking at how technology is impacting culture, that mm-hmm. our relationships are getting much weaker and that we suffer when when we're not investing in relationship. So like, what kind of like what kind of when you talk about invest I mean the relationships and the relational work you've done, what does that look like? Like what 
you know, just in terms of community building, bringing people together, like just. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, we wanted to find ways in which uh, families could start not only uh, building relationships with each other, sort of uh, parent support, but we also wanted to um, help uh parents as, as primary religious educators and finding ways to make that happen all together, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, building those relationships. And, <clears throat> and so uh, one of the things that we implemented was a family breakfast twice a month, I'm sorry, twice a year, uh, once in the fall and once in the spring, where we uh, bring our families and our children together, the fall family breakfast. And this is, I should say, during worship. Um, because oh, family breakfast. So fam families together during worship. worship. And what did you do during that time? What was that? So like? uh, in the fall, we really focus on um, helping families come up with rituals that they can start bringing into their year. So one year we created chalices and we gave, we uh, had a donation of um, uh, a number of the Cup of Light books um, from uh, the UUA. And so we, uh, we were able to do that. Uh, we try to find uh, um, ways in which we, they can actually bring their faith home and create rituals. So that was one thing that we focus on in the fall. In the spring, or the winter, I should say, in January, we really focus that time on social action. Mm -hmm. And so the families uh, uh, doing something together. Uh, and so one of the ways in which we did that is we have an organ organization that I actually uh, volunteer with called Summit Helping Its People, or mm -hmm. SHIP. The acronym, and uh, they uh, need sack lunches on right. a daily basis. And so we created a situation where we had two teams um, having to uh, create those sack lunches uh, as a relay race. And mm -hmm. one team actually created 75 sack lunches in four and a half minutes. Whoa! <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, so something which sounds fun. <laughs> Yes, it was. It was fun. Uh, other ways in which we've been doing this is we have parents night out. This is a support piece for our preschool families, yeah. in which our uh, once one Friday a month, uh, our preschool families can um, leave their children at the congregation for child care. And because we're on the edge of downtown, there are many restaurants within walking distance. And mm -hmm. so they have two hours to go out, have dinner with themselves, dinner with other families. And then that's once a month. That's once. Yeah. Well, we're working towards oh, okay. once a month. Yeah, okay. we've piloted it, and so we're, we're trying to get it up. And it's a cooperative, so one family works with some of our child caregivers. I love that. I want that. I want that. <laughs> yeah. So can I just yeah. that? I love the idea that uh, to support families in mm -hmm. bringing you know, religious education and uh, practices home. Yeah. You took ta dedicated time or take dedicated time on when on a Sunday mm -hmm. during worship to have a special event to support that. So instead of you're not sending emails, oh, try this, try, well, maybe you can supplement too, but uh, you're actually bringing people together and coaching them and supporting them and doing that work at home through a really special event. Yes. Yeah, and even the social justice piece in January, we have conversations around that. We facilitate conversations with them so that they, they can even take some of those conversations home. So, um, so yes, and then other ways with, that we're now, we've just piloted, we have community circles, so mm -hmm. it's our small groups. Yep. Uh, we've been offering them. We all have small groups for children, um, so we, we do those on Sunday mornings, but we also have small groups for adults, but now we've, we've piloted a new group that are actually meeting in two different homes and it's families doing small groups fantastic families you know, doing small groups is one of my passions i've been working with our congregations of small groups for you know, since for ages um and that was the model i used with my youth group when i was a youth advisor so tell so um you've got adult groups children using small groups um for, for religious education sure. on, on, Sundays, mm, on sundays sure yeah and then now piloting the family groups. So, uh, how's that going? So it's 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 going really well. Um, the families who are, pr are participating in that small group are really loving it because it's it's in their it's in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. basically. 
So they don't have to drive far. They all get to be together. Um, it's okay. They're all, um, as, as one of our parents said, they're, everyone's fine with the craziness of having the children sort of in the other room and coming in and sort of coming into the circle. So there's time for the children to, and parents to be apart. And then they also come together. So it's working nice. really well. I would say that uh, the other piece of this is that the shift from um, uh, regular programming throughout the program year from uh, September to May for our second through our seventh graders who are the ones who meet on um, Sunday mornings in addition to our preschool um, and K-1 group. Uh, we have shifted that structure. So now mm -hmm. they have a seven Sunday series of small groups. Um, in the fall and a seven Sunday series of small groups in the winter spring and then okay. at any other time uh, so November December January and then it'll be April and May they are in whole worship mm -hmm. and so this, this is a new piece and we're living into this piece Wait, so that the children have so it's a series of small group based gatherings for children it's like a yeah. module seven sessions seven, seven sessions and then yeah. they're in worship with the whole congregation mm -hmm. all right yeah and we we lifted up the owl model so you mm -hmm. have owl has a you know a definitive start in time it's very specific in its uh content and so we wanted to find other ways in which we could emulate that mm -hmm. and so for second and third graders i actually co-wrote with two other people a social justice series that was based on our social justice team the yep. legs of our social justice team so racial immigration and environmental justice and then for our fourth and fifth graders they were actually doing owl so we had um those definite it starting in times and they we also scheduled right. them at times where attendance was uh, generally the most high mm -hmm. in the year and uh, and it worked really well uh, for those seven weeks, uh, from the it ended up being the begin the end of September to the beginning of November, and so now our children are moving into their second month of being in whole congregational worship. Now, um, I want to say first for people tuning in live, if you have a comment, I mean a question, feel free to share it in a comment, uh, and we can ha take a few questions in a little bit. And later on, after this is recorded and it's online, feel free to ask questions, and that can fuel further discussion, whether it's with Laura Beth, someone else, just our community. So questions welcome. So I love that you're experimenting with uh, congregational, whole congregation worship, the small groups. Uh, when when I was years ago, my home congregation, I was a chair of our RE committee. We had an experience where this is in First Unitarian Church of Providence mm -hmm. and the our religious educator um, then and still is Kathy Sagel. Yes, we Kathy. had to, we were doing a big uh, building renovation, and our entire RE wing was taken down. And we had the challenge: do we ship the children out to like some other site, or put them in a little trailer? Like, what do we do with these core grades? It was like the elementary mm -hmm. grades, and we decided to do worship as religious education and create a second worship service that was earlier. Uh, and so for that, like I forget how long we did that was over a year uh, mm -hmm. we did worship for those core families it was designed for them knowing that the whole congregation could attend and some people attended both services mm -hmm. but then we also had to do small group activities to supplement that so that those children maintain relationships and have the benefits of small groups because i think one thing that comes up in the context of looking at all these changes and oh do we do more um, whole congregation worship, I question, I mean, some people are like, oh, we have to get rid of religious education and small groups and just do the the whole congregation worship. And I think it's like, whoa, there's still relational work that has to be done. You have to, there's a cultural, I mean, there's issues around changing culture. How do you meet these different needs? So can you speak to a little bit about the, the value and role of whole congregation worship versus sure. small groups? I think that'd be really helpful for people. Yeah, sure. So for us, we um, because we have uh, uh, noticed and what we've learned from history that our children are just not um, they have not been experienced in our larger uh, worship services that we um, we haven't been retaining them. Right. And so um, that was certainly our, our instigator. Now, as far as 
um, having children in worship. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is uh, information that Kim Sweeney um, really speaks to. And so I guess I will, you know, lift up some of her work, but she talks about, uh, you know, 12 reasons to welcome kids into worship. And that is, you know, acknowledging that children are spiritual beings. And so mm -hmm. when we welcome our children into worship, we acknowledge that they are part of our religious community. And, uh, and what has been, um, sort of a growing edge for us is that when we welcome our children into worship, we welcome our adults. Right. And sometimes the, um, uh, people who don't have children um, don't quite understand that, right? Um, and so that's been a learning for us. And um, I also uh, think one of the pieces for us has been that um, we get to practice generosity. Mm -hmm. And this, this is that third piece, that mikasa e sukasa, that spirit of generosity piece is, um, uh, it's, it's really, uh, the glue, as they say, that holds the collectivist communities together. Um, that uh, can you say because you, you're saying that that mi casa es su casa piece mm -hmm. is the glue. Can you just just tell people what that for you what that means for a congregation that concept? Well, I mean, I just think, to recap. Sure. Um, so as far as the 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 mi casa es su casa, when we talk about the glue that holds. Uh, that holds cult we cultures together. It 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 really is about the the reciprocity. So it's we're continually giving to one another. We understand that um, children are um, are giving to our worship. Their presence is meaningful um, for adults. It's not just that adults' presence are meaningful for them. <laughs> um, and that understanding of that. And 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 when we do understand that, and we have a deep. Uh, when we own that, mm -hmm. um, then th then generosity can um, can reveal itself, right? Because we all want to be together. That has to be at the core. Is that we all want to be together? Um, yeah. We have a few questions that I just want to, um, which are related. So um, there's, we have some questions coming in about. So how when does your whole congregation worship with children involved? How does that look or feel differently than what we might characterize as some traditional, just adult oriented worship? Not that, because I think when we make, I personally feel that when worship is appealing for children, it's more appealing for adults. So I actually think great worship is great worship. And when we do it well with, you know, with hitting a lot of different um, important aspects, it starts working for everyone even more. So it's not like, oh, this is adult worship and this is children's worship. But can you share a little bit of your learning? Like what's what's worked in terms of um, whole congregation worship? Like just what, is that, what does that look like? Right. So, and, and then um, we will work towards wrapping up because I know I want to respect okay, your time. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so what that is looking like right now, we're still evolving and trying new things. Mm -hmm. um, but we have added more music. We've um, we've always been uh, focused in storytelling anyway, but um, the minister who's preaching also brings and lifts up more stories throughout the sermons. We have a lot more on our a lot more images uh, on our big screen mm -hmm. um, that we put throughout the service, and, and we have in addition to what we call our activity packets yep. that we offer our younger children. Um, we try to offer something every week in that packet that is tied to the content of what they're doing uh, or what's the, the, the theme. And so sometimes that might look like a word search that has specific words mm -hmm. that the minister is going to lift up. Um, in the sermon, it may look last, last week we told a story of a peacock. We were, uh, we're focusing on humility uh, this month at Beacon. And yeah. so they received a peacock picture that they were able to color. So we tried to add that is very, very specific. Um, uh, those are um, some of the bigger pieces that we're doing. We're, uh, we're not um, necessarily we're not cutting sermons. We do believe that kids are can, can handle sermons. Yeah. Um, and uh, but we're you know the ministers are also being aware that children are there. So what uh, what are, what are some of the language that they might otherwise um, use if it was just adults? Mm -hmm. Recognizing that that children are going to be in there, but definitely more music, more images, and we have more children and youth participating as worship uh, leaders. So, Outstanding. So, yeah, that is so. so good. So what I, and as you've moved towards having the these um, small group series, you know, time limited. Well, not time limited, but like distinct periods of time or mm -hmm. modules for 
uh, small groups for children, and then all age, I mean, all um, whole congregation worship. Mm-hmm. What has the impact been in your congregation in terms of attendance, energy, participation, feedback? How are people responding? I, I think people are responding as we had expected them to, which is um, uh, some some families are really, really excited about this. They really want to be with their children. Some families are struggling with not having that me time. You know, and mm-hmm. so it, it's an educational piece. Um, the other wow. piece that I'll say that we're bringing in is that our minister, uh, Reverend Emily, she is uh, creating a blog or writing blog articles once a week called Parenting in the Pew. And it's a book that based on uh, she's basing the blog on on that book uh, by Robbie Castleman. And uh, that has been a huge resource to our parents to, to Parenting prepare. in the Pew. Parenting All right. in the Pew. And, and you I'll, I'll go back and um, wherever this video is, recorded ad ad links so people can find so, so the you can book the blog yeah, so, etc so the parenting in the pew by robbie kesselman the um the the articles for parenting in the pew can be found at summitbeacon.org you just need to scroll down onto the right yep, um, okay. and you'll see um parenting in the pew there um and so that those also have been wonderful resources right. um, but we have people willing to come to the table and willing to try to make it work um our families are willing to do that and that's most of the battle. Right. So, and it yeah. sounds like you've developed a great culture around needing to experiment. Yes. Which I, I mean, think if we don't, if, if, if we're maintaining a culture like, hey, this is the way it is, and anything that happens is a threat, that's problematic because we are needing to c- continually adapt, I think. Right. Hey, one specific question um, that was asked is, do you use a specific space for children? Like whether it's, children can sit over here and work on activities. I know some congregations are experimenting with specific play or prayer space and this, uh, yeah. that, little tables. What is, can you just speak to like the specifics so we of- have, um, We have a very um, a New England white uh, mm-hmm. church, a uh, white um, building church that's uh, pretty quintessential. And our space doesn't allow for anything at the front. Yeah. Um, what we do have is we have activity tables toward the back for our youngest. Mm-hmm. We're going to be leaving the service about 15 minutes through anyway. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to bring them up front. And we are in a capital campaign to to build another building right next door, that uh, the property that we own. But right now, it logistically, it just isn't, uh, it isn't right. working. Well. But I hear for so many people, it's been such a, um, a great addition to their worship services. Great. Well, so as we move towards wrapping up this uh, conversation, which I want to say thank you. This has been fantastic. What? How can people connect with you and what's coming up with your work? I know that we talked about you, you offer a lot of workshops, and I know, um, you know in this next year there's some things on the horizon. Tell us a little bit about sure. what's coming up next. So I would say stay posted. I can't really quite announce it yet, but um, there should be – um, an online version of the uh, the collective sustainability volunteer strategy um, piece that's coming up. So um, I can say more about that once that is confirmed. Um, so so there's that. And um, also, I continue to fi- try to find the bridge between um, my yoga work and you you work. And there's so many wonderful bridges, especially around conscious activism, which is basically that. Um, that work of uh, self inquiry that um, helps us understand our own past, our own challenges, mm-hmm. our own traumas, so that we move into the work with that knowledge. Um, we just dis- we can discern our call in the world better, and that we're not perpetuating harm, right? right. And so um, I am uh, working on some workshops around that as well. And so uh, so yes, as, as soon as as soon as dates and uh, venues get. Um, solidified i will let you know well and yeah you let me know and i'll share with my uu audience which is everywhere at uu planet um that's the hub for my uu work and then i do larger work with congregations um so thank you so much for joining us and for um, offering this conversation and sharing your work appreciate all that you do and um i'm just grateful to um you for this time and to for everyone tuning in thank you please share this video with anyone who you know is experimenting with like how do we adapt to our changing world how do we do religious education in this day and age 
which is going to change in a few months. So how do we keep on top of it? And how do we just, you know, we have to keep learning together. So thank um I'm just grateful for this growing learning community. I'm constantly experimenting with like how to use videos and interviews like this just to accelerate our learning and learn together. So thank you everyone. And uh, I have some new things coming out soon, just more online learning. So that'll be my December gift to you. I'll actually share with you all the things I've been working on in the lab. All right, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon, Laura Beth. Thanks. Bye everyone.